I know that some in our audience know the finer points of hockey. The Chris Johnston Show. We are your friends. The biggest stories, bringing you inside the game. What did you hear? The Chris Johnston Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Want to bet? What is going on? Here's Chris with your host, Julian McKenzie. Part of the game. We have a lot of trade talk to talk about today. Eric Carlson's going to come up. Jacob Schickrin's going to come up. I'm going to ask you about Yessi Pugliarvi, Patrick Kane, and his situation. And of course, it's Monday, so we're going to have questions for Ask CJ. Before I start with Eric Carlson, though, if, for those who didn't realize, uh, CJ uh, put out a report over the weekend saying that uh, the Sharks and the Oilers have uh, have uh, re, uh, reignited some talks, potentially, about uh, Eric Carlson. I would like to know, when you get that piece of information and you put it out there in the internet, what's that feeling like? What's that adrenaline feeling like? It's pretty cool. I mean, you know, I'm I'm a bit of a, a veteran, so it's it's maybe not doesn't have the same buzz as, as when I was younger, but it's still pretty cool. I mean, you just know your phone's gonna blow up. Um, you know, from people commenting on Twitter, but also people texting you and the whole like. I mean, it's it's fun. It was on a Saturday uh, where I really wasn't otherwise working. So it kind of chewed up a couple hours that I, I didn't expect to work, but I mean, that that's the job. And, and honestly, I'm not complaining about that. It, it just, it's um, look, this is a crazy time of year. Uh, I think I've gushed about this a bunch, but like it's, there's so much going on. There's, there's a lot of information flying around. I'm obviously pestering a whole bunch of people around the league. Um. I'm I'm starting to count down till March fourth. If I'm being honest, I mean, it, it the the trade deadline is fun, but it it gets long some of these days. So Saturday Saturday was interesting, um, you know. But I, I'm confident in the report. That's the no issues there. I mean, it's you, you know everyone immediately wants to weed through and say, well, what's the likelihood of this happening? That I mean, that wasn't the spirit of what was said. I mean, what's really notable to me is this is at least the second time this year that I'm aware of that the Oilers have engage the sharks or, or vice versa on, you know, figuring out if there's a fit with Eric Carlson. And obviously it's not an easy one with the salary commitments and, and the money and all that stuff. But, you know, the fact that they've tried once and are trying again, and it's, you know, two and a half weeks, three weeks to the trade deadline, you know, pretty notable that that's where the Oilers minds are at. And, you know, we'll see where it goes from here. Here's what I'm curious about, right? Like Eric Carlson on that team, which we know is charged offensively as it is with two of the best players in the world. I mean, I mean Leon Dreisaitl and, and Connor McDavid, obviously. And we gush about the power play a lot. And I'm not saying it's absolutely perfect, but we, 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 would, we would see a guy like Eric Carlson get plugged in there. And But like, I wonder, is it's kind of a weird, a weird, ridiculous question to ask, but is an offensive defenseman of Eric Carlson's caliber the player that the Oilers need compared to like, a defensive defenseman. Well, that is the question to ask. I think it's the question that's they've been kicking around inside the Oilers brain trust for months now is, is, you know, if the team has a deficiency, it's, it's probably in its ability to defend, but the flip side of that coin is that I don't think there's anyone that can go head to head with them when they're at their best offensively. I mean, you, you mentioned dry and McDavid at the top of the scoring list. You've got Zach Hyman and, and Ryan Nugent Hopkins in the top 15 in league scores right now, Eric Carlson's fourth uh, as we're recording this at this moment in league scoring, you could have five of the top 13 or 14 scores in the league on one team. Um, you know, it, it would be a great experiment. I, I don't know if it would work, honestly. I'm not sure that they know. I mean, the, the flip side too, Julian, when we talk about who else they might get is if they go and trade for Joel Edmondson to name, you know, a left shot defenseman that's available. Like, does that, and, and I say this with respect to Joel Edmondson, does that really make them a better, like he is a good defensive player, but the, how much does that change about the team overall? I mean, if you're getting Eric Carlson, like, look at, he's averaging over 25 minutes a game right now. Um, you know, you're dropping him on to an already insanely lethal power play. And he's done a lot of the, the you know, generate a lot of the offense offense at five on five for, for San Jose this season. So it's a it's a game breaker. It's a difference maker. I think it's one that the Oilers' top players are at least curious about too. Like I, I think that they're on board with the idea of it. And so, you know, I don't see any harm for sure in exploring if a trade can work. Uh, just just to see if there's a fit. I mean, really, it, that's what every team 
any team we might talk about as as contenders is doing right i mean that they're they're going around at various targets figuring out what the price is figuring out where the fit might be and then trying to make the best decision with all that information uh, of course we don't end up necessarily finding out about all those various conversations um just the way it goes but that's a lot of what's happening league wide right now and so you know sure the oilers this this is their home run swing if if they ever complete this type of deal i think that there's a lot of other smaller types of moves you know whether it's maybe getting a gavrikov getting an edmondson you know making a trade for someone else you know maybe even a gostas bear i think is someone they've looked at in arizona um but eric carlson is on point on pace for 110 points this year like it, i think i think it's happened like 10 times in the league history and it's bobby Orr and paul coffee and like like very few players have ever had this season like it's pretty damn tempting, isn't it? And here's the other thing that I haven't seen pointed out, you know, in all the discussion about this, that's the, when you, we say like, what's it like to sort of birth this baby into the earth, right? When you tweet something like this or report something like this, it, you know, I get it. All the other reporters pile in and, you know, they try to add their, their perspective on it. And that, that's all fair. Like there's, I have no, no hard feelings. There's no problems or anything, but like everyone's assessing the likelihood and this and that it's like, one thing that you have to remember is for sure, if this deal happens, there will be some amount of retention on the contract. I don't know how much, like I, I think the sharks are willing to go to 20% right now, but can you get them to 30 or 40%? Let's just, let's just hype. Like we'll game theory this out a bit. If okay. you get, if you get Eric Carlson at seven or seven and a half million for this season, and he's got, yes, he's got those four more years beyond it. Like he's an asset, I think moving forward because the Oilers, if they ever wanted to trade him in the future or another team that gets him at that amount, they could retain down the road. So that next trade could be Eric Carlson at like 4 million. And even of course, if he ages and, and you know, if this is just a one-off season, I mean, this looks like it's going to be his absolute best season as you know, by production he's ever had. And this guy's won two Norris trophies and has been an absolute boss in, in the prime of his career. I still think he's, he's not a negative asset. If, if the sharks retain enough money, where then you could subsequently trade them to another team in the future. If you ever decide you need, you know, it didn't work or, or whatever's going on, you know, that's, that's what this should be about. Um, it's not just, you know, you, yes, you're assuming the risk of those years, but I, I think that, that it's not, you, you don't own him at 11 and a half million. Like that's, that's the key part of this. And so let's see where it goes. You know, I, I think the Oilers really are, thinking big it doesn't mean this this can happen i mean look this this deal if it ever happens will be i think it'd be like a monster type of deal like you're looking at at least one first round pick and multiple young players or prospects you know other contracts may be involved to make the money line up and then you see what the retention is like it, it would be the kind of trade we don't see every day in, in in the nhl but you know kudos for trying and um man i would i would be fascinated to see eric carlson on the set on on the i was gonna say on the senators i've seen that before on the oilers we, we, we have uh but i'd be fascinated to see him on this oilers team like i it would it would be a gamble but it it might be the right gamble like i think that they're they're debating internally do we try to improve marginally in the area we're not as good at or do we just like go all in on what we're special at and see if that's good enough and with no disrespect to Joel Edmondson again, an Eric Carlson trade way sexier ahead of the deadline than a Joel Edmondson trade. Again, no disrespect to Joel. Well, how many trades are we going to see in this period? And I think we've already seen one for sure where every team in a league that's also trying to win the cup goes, Oh wow. Okay. Like that's real. Like for me, Tarasenko going to the Rangers is that. Yeah. Um, and he scores of course, on his first shot in his first game, uh, playing for that team, like teaming up with Artemi Panera and a player that he's got a, a history with, you know, I think that that is a true like potential difference maker move for the Rangers. They were aggressive in doing it. I say this with respect to Bo Horvat, who's having a fantastic season is a great player. I just think the Islanders aren't a team that most like they're making that move to try to get into the playoffs. You know, the Rangers are, are making a move like Tarasenko, you know, giving up a first round pick for a rental to try to win a, the whole damn thing. Um, I, you know, so I think, you know, if a top tier contender gets Timo Meyer, that probably has the same effect. If Eric Carlson's traded to a team like Edmonton, that has the same effect, but there's only a handful of those moves that like the ground shakes a little bit in a league and everyone's like looking around like, okay, something just changed. And, you know, we know where the Oilers are at. Like it's, it's not to make this about the Leafs. It's a similar spot to the Leafs. Like they've had the same core players that have consistently been amazing and they've won lots of regular season games and this and this and that. And it doesn't last forever, right? 
The Leafs have, you know, contractual decisions pending on William Nylander and Austin Matthews. You know, dry subtle, I think is two seasons left. Like, like it's not, and I'm not saying he won't resign in Edmonton, but if he does, it's going to be at a much higher number. You know, like you only have what you have for a small window to try to really go for it. And so I, I think that there's, I think there's a case to be made to, to just, you know, say F it, let's go. F them picks. Well, I mean, the picks are only so good, right? Like, like you, even if you pick a good player, usually it's four to five years before that player really is making a difference in your lineup. Like he might be playing games, obviously it depends positionally, but like the Oilers aren't drafting at the top of the first round, right? Like they're, they're at best, they're trying to like get a steal at 21 or whatever. Like, and, and it might even be beyond that if they have a long playoff run and end up picking 27th or, or what have you. So, or even 32nd, if they win the Stanley cup. So the point is, is that like, it's nice to have those picks. It's nice to have a pipeline. You know, I'm, but at a certain point, I do think like Tampa Bay has traded a lot of first round picks, Julian, and they got they got a couple banners, new fresh ones up there at Emily Arena and could have had a third one last year and they could add it. Maybe they add it this year. Like, I, I do think that the, the very top teams, you got to be smart about it. I'm, I'm not saying go go waste them all on rental players, but Eric Carlson's not a rental like you're you're adding him with the idea that you've got multiple runs with him and McDavid and Dreisaitl like this year plus a couple more at minimum and and as i said if it doesn't work out for any reason if he's not happy if the fit doesn't work i think he's still a tradable asset that that you can get something back for because you know all of a sudden you're trading him at a fraction of his current cost because we've seen teams like tampa like throw first round picks for guys like brandon hagel like how does that affect eric carlson's asking price i know you kind of mentioned it uh you know it would probably cost like about a, a high pick and maybe some prospects uh, like, like, I'd like to know, like, if we can paint as much of a picture of what an asking price for EK would look like, and also which other teams have kicked tires on it. Well, there was a report at some point, and I, I'm not sure who it's from, that it was going to be three first round picks. Like, I've been told that's just not true. Okay. So okay. it's not, I don't think it's that high. Really, though, what dictates it is is how much retention and the salary there is. And, and I realize this is kind of boring, maybe if you're not into the cap stuff, but like there's real money there, right? Like if they were to retain 50%, which is the maximum they can do. And, and to be clear, the Sharks, that's a no go for them. Like I think they've told every team that's even called, like they're not even, they're not getting near 50%, but 50% wow. would be, but I'm just saying it would be roughly like $20 million in actual money over the life of the contract that they would be spending not to have them on their roster. So, you know, if they get to 40%, and I haven't done the math on each of those levels, it's it's real money attached to that. And so assets have to come back to reflect that. And I think that's where you find the fit. And so is the best way to do that, you know, a team playing paying more picks or or prospects to make up for that? Or or is there a way to do it where they'll take on useful contracts um of players to make the money work and, and maybe retain a little bit less? And so I don't think we can sketch out the exact trade because we don't know what the retention is. But I I do think in, in the situation of Edmonton, you know, you've probably got a player or two off the roster. I don't know if that's like a Tyson Berry or, you know, Jesse Puli I mean, you're going to have to create one way or another, you're going to have to create the, the cap space to even take Eric Carlson on. And then, you know, the Oilers have a bunch of young prospects and they, they have draft picks and, and it was some combination of their, their prospect pool and, and their draft picks, you know, and, and I know that that's vague, but it's because I don't, I don't even know if an official offer is even on the table yet. Like I, I, my sense is they're exploring if there's a fit, but I don't know that it's, it is like we're offering you this, 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 this for Eric Carlson at, you know, 35% retained or whatever it is. I, I don't think it's got to that stage. Um, and so, yeah, look, there's not many teams that can do this in season. There's not many teams. I think I would argue it makes sense. There might be one team where it makes sense to do it before March 3rd. And, and that's in Edmonton. Um, this is a unique opportunity, right? It's Eric Carlson kind of on top of the world. Like he might win another Norris this year. And I would say that would be out of nowhere for most people. And look what Edmonton has, like, like Edmonton scores like crazy. It, it would be, it would be fantastic theater anyway. I mean, I, I'm always rooting for chaos. There was an ask CJ question. I don't know if you saw it, but it was like, can you manifest this? And I was like, man, if I could manifest this kind of thing, the NHL would be, have a lot more chaos than it currently does with the transactions. But uh, this was one that at least it's at least possible, at least as of today. Anything else you want to add with regards to Carlson before we bring on DB? 
I think we'll put a pin in it there, but you know, by Thursday, I'm sure this will have evolved a little bit and, and we're just kind of monitor where things go. I mean, it's, it's a big development though, that they're, they're back at it. Cause the team spoke at some point in December, I think around mid December, maybe a little earlier than that. And at that point in time, I think the Oilers did decide like, you know, maybe this isn't, this isn't the right guy um, because, because of the reasons we've talked about, maybe we should be prioritizing a defensive defenseman and something like that. And then, you know, Somewhere along the line here, you know, we've had an all-star break. We've had some of the Oilers' top players at, at the all-star game where Eric Carlson represented the, the Sharks. You know, it just seems like there's renewed interest. And, you know, that's I, – I like that. Look, and Edmonton's been red hot. I mean, I know they lost the game uh, on Sunday afternoon in, in Montreal, but, you know, I think they won 11 or 12 games without a without a loss in regulation. So they've been they've been climbing the Pacific Division standings, and I think they're getting a little bit bold. Good on them. Yeah, good on them. Uh, for the rest of us who want to see some exciting trade stuff. Okay, let's get to sports interaction with David Bastel and then I'll hold your fire for some of the other guys I want to talk to you about with regards to trades. You can bet that with David Bastel. Brought to you by Sports Interaction. Get in the action and make a play. 19 plus. Please play responsibly. It's time for You Can Bet That, people. Welcome to You Can Bet That with David Bastel. Hope you had yourself a good weekend, buddy. Very good. Hope the same for you as well. Busy Sunday um, on the ice in the afternoon, uh, football coverage in the evening kind of thing, right? Yeah, something like that. I just want to point out something, though. Uh, we're going to revisit some of the uh, bets over the last little while, mm -hmm. uh, and then we're going to get to uh, Ottawa Calgary really quickly. But uh, when we did the Rihanna first song prop, yep. I remember vividly uh, better have my money having the longest odds of any of those songs there for the first song and it ends up being the first song picked i uh <laughs> want to bet with my friend uh for dinner uh and i'm very happy and excited about that nice and, and what was the name of that song julian could you tell us uh better have my money i'm not going to repeat the first name uh <laughs> i didn't get in trouble the last time i said the full name but uh, i thought i thought i, I was the boss man adam wild I don't want Adam Wilde getting mad at me for for Fair losing enough. out on any ad revenue. I don't know. So so on that note of uh, of Rihanna's halftime show, so black hair was the winner, red outfit was the winner. Oh yeah. So, so those are two yeah. other things, and and congrats on nailing that. That's fantastic. I hope it's a I hope it's a great restaurant. By the way, um, tails. Oh, I will make sure it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tails was the coin toss so so the tails won their purple gatorade a lot of people weren't sure yes. hey what color was it? it was purple and and the most unique one that we talked about and we you know we talk about some different ones throughout the weeks and stuff like that was the canadians actually scored more goals than the Chiefs scored touchdowns I, I, they did I, they had i, a I would have weekend. never have led that everybody ever. astray i led everybody astray <laughs> i was like the halves don't score the Chiefs are a juggernaut, and look what it, happens. Yeah, six to five, six to five. Uh, mark it down as a Montreal Canadiens W if if uh, if people bet that. So that was that was it, it was fun, and and you know what? I think a lot of people bet on the Chiefs that day as far as more touchdowns and goals as well. But it, it's it's like we've always said, anything can happen on uh, on game day, and, and it certainly did. I'd like to Absolutely. know what happened Saturday night with the Edmonton Oilers. Just just yeah. Yeah, that's this is true. <laughs> that was not much of a Sunday afternoon performance. I, I was going to say Montreal Saturday night. Ah, who knows, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, know I, like I mean, that. I don't know if. It, yeah, maybe a good night at Ziggy's. Yeah, probably not. maybe. <laughs> so see how see how quiet Chris got. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I've had a few good okay. nights at Ziggy's. I I would have. I know you've had it a few nights. I'd have a hard time believing a group of professional athletes would have a good time in there. But if yeah. you're, if you're a middle-aged sports writer, that's, that's the spot. That is, that is. Hey, speaking yeah. of uh, just to wrap up Super Bowl quickly, our odds are out for next year's Super Bowl already um, in order, yeah. Kansas city, Buffalo, San Francisco, uh, anywhere between four and a half to six, uh, six to one odds. Philadelphia is in that six to one category and uh, CJ, the Dallas Cowboys are listed right now at SIA as 10 to one odds to win the Super Bowl. They're the sixth place team as far as the the rankings are concerned. Um, they're, they're a very public team as far as, you know, people thinking they're going to break through, break through, but you know what? 
pretty good roster and and you know that they're going to try to retool in certain positions and see what next year has to offer but i know it's early we're in the middle of february uh anything can happen in the next six seven months hope springs anew it's going to yes. be the cowboys year i'm going to manifest this <laughs> you just need a new owner a new head coach and a bunch of new players and everything else will be fine Th that's it i know what, and it can happen you see what you just did db you see what you just did db you just gave this poor sap some hope about the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> I don't have to give Dallas Cowboy fans hope. They always have hope. It, it's like a yeah. you know, like a Leafs fan in a sense, right? Just a the football <laughs> version. And no disrespect because Leaf fans have mega hope. And then of course something happens and then it's, you know, but I actually like the Dallas Cowboys. I, I you know, honestly, the offense looks really good. There's uh, there's a couple playmakers on defense. They might need to strengthen a, a little bit of the interior and stuff like that, but for the most part, you know, but you're right. I, I'm not a big Are we Mike winning McCarthy anything fan. with Dak, though? Are we winning yeah. anything with Dak? Like, that's, that's true, right? That's true. Just, so, okay, we got to move off of Dallas Cowboys. Yeah, I know, I know. This segment is in the mud. More. It is. Seriously. Before <laughs> we get CJ even more sad, <laughs> Ottawa and Calgary are playing in the nation's yes. capital tonight, and Calgary's favorite to win that game. Yeah, Calgary's favorite, slight favorites to win Ottawa at home, five and five in the last 10 games. Um, you know what? Six and a half, the goal total. Terrible injury to Anton Forsberg. Uh, I, I I haven't heard of tearing two MCLs in the same play. I mean, holy smokes. He just, you know, I'm glad he has a contract, though, so that's good. But uh, any leans on the old Canadian matchup, CJ, in the uh, nation's capital? I will guarantee more goals will be scored there than touchdowns scored in any NFL game on Monday. That's fair. I love that <laughs> good evaluation. I like it. <laughs> big win in Cal Calgary had a big win in Buffalo too. So yeah, yeah, making that. Yeah, they they, in, they uh, need the wins. Close. They need the wins absolutely, considering how uh, they keep starting and stopping. Uh, I yeah, I, I I mean I'm not going to bet all the game as someone cover that team, but uh, you know, hey, I can understand why people will favor the Calgary Flames. Don't forget to check out sportsinteraction.com slash sdpn for all the best odds before game, in game, and the best props. Sportsinteraction.com slash sdpn. I'm a bit nervous about mentioning this next player, Jacob Chikrin, only because uh, we know over the weekend he was scratched uh, from uh, the Lost Coyotes game for, and I'm not I'm not just saying this. This, this is what the Coyotes said trade related reasons so that is very likely you could be listening to the show and he may have already been traded maybe not but maybe he might have been what do we know about jacob chikrin right now yeah i almost was like do we have to make this really quick in case it's just totally by the time it's even released it's just dated yeah. um I, what, what i can tell you is this i've never heard a team actually announce trade related reasons obviously we've seen a never. number of players a number of players over the years have been scratched under similar circumstances, but I've never heard it termed quite that way. And so when you see that on Saturday, a real shockwave goes through, you know, people doing our job, a lot of speculation out there. And I would, the best way to describe it is a cone of silence was, was dropped around a lot of the key principles that would be involved here. So we're, we're operating a little bit on secondhand sources. You know, I would say that the Los Angeles Kings appear to be, the front runner for Jacob Chikrin, you know, he's a player they've had interest in, you know, going back, I think a year, or a year and a half since, since he's Chikrin's basically been on, on the trade market for a long, long period of time. Um, and, you know, LA feels like it has a need on the left side of its defense, obviously has a number of young players and prospects that it's integrated in its lineup. Chikrin sort of fits the mold. He's, you know, he's only 24 turning 25 in March, but you know, it's signed for a couple more years could be a good fit there. Um, if there's another team that's, that's still in the bidding, I'm not really aware of it. I mean, we know the Boston Bruins have kicked around on Chikrin and have, have been knocking on that door, but I, you know, I have nothing beyond knowing that that's something that's happened to say that they're at the finish line now, or they're, you know, part of this bidding. And I think what's a little strange is that we're recording this on Monday morning and it's, you know, it's 36 hours after the, the trade related reason scratch. I mean, usually if that scratch happens, it's because the trade is there. There may be haggling over like the final draft pick or, you know, some conditions on on a pick or something. And, and the trade is essentially guaranteed. I don't know that that's the case here. I mean, you know, the, the longer this goes on without the trade, it suggests that, OK, maybe some progress was made. But, um, you know, from the Kings perspective, I, I think that they look at this and think nothing has changed. Like they've been interested in Jikrin. They've engaged the Coyotes on Jikrin. But the only thing that's changed is all of a sudden the player was held out of a game. It doesn't mean that that you know that they're right 
you know, crossing off the last small items of, of a complex transaction. And, and so that's basically where we're at. I mean, I, I wish I had more tangible information to share. Um, you know, if, if it's sort of like gun to my head, what's going to happen here, I would say that, that he's ultimately going to be traded to Los Angeles, but maybe there's a surprise. Like maybe there's a dramatic twist at the end. Maybe this is a move made. And again, I'm, I'm operating a little bit blind because a lot of the key people involved in this are not saying anything, you know, maybe this is part of, you know, scratching him is done to try to drum up a little bit more interest to, to sort of signal to the other teams that have been interested. Like, look, we got something close here. So step up and make your best offer. If you're just waiting in the wings, you know, ultimately I think we'll probably be able to piece this together a little better in reverse, but as, as we're living it in real time, there's, it's, it's kind of a, it's an unusual, unusual set of circumstances. One other element about this potential trade uh, that intrigues me is the inclusion or maybe exclusion of uh, prospect Brent Clark from L.A. Uh, I've seen a few people say, oh, he's going to be in a deal. Uh, some people have said he's not going to be in a deal. Scott Wheeler, a colleague at The Athletic, Scott Wheeler, uh, was with his wife, was giving birth to their second child and took the time to announce that that was happening and that Brent Clark is not getting traded, which I think is one of the wildest ways you can announce uh, a detail. Uh, what What's your thoughts on 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 that element of a potential Chikrin deal? I'd be surprised if Brent Clark was there. I mean, look, this is a this is a young kid who played nine games in Los Angeles before going to the World Juniors, winning a gold medal in Canada. You know, back in junior hockey right now. But you know, he's he made a strong impression on the Kings in in the in the fall to to crack their lineup out of training camp, and you know, pretty high draft pick. I mean, I, I'll never say never, but. It, I, that one doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And it sounds like the Kings have, have tried to sort of ease Brant Clark's uh, mind on that, that, that he's not part of this potential deal. I mean, there's a lot of wild stuff floating around. I mean, I, I do think Los Angeles has at least been interested in Vimalka, the, the goaltender in Arizona, who, you know, when you look at some of the underlying numbers for goaltenders in terms of goals saved above expected has has performed quite well behind a team, obviously not designed to win a whole bunch of games this year. He's under contract a couple more seasons at a very manageable number. We know, but you know, Los Angeles has struggles in the crease this year with Cal Peterson being sent to the American Hockey League. Jonathan Quick at the end of his run, you know, finally, uh, you know, his contract expires this summer. Maybe, maybe this grows into something bigger. I mean, that's that's highly speculative, but that speculation is out there. And and you know, the one thing I can say is I know the Kings have at least had interest in Vimalka. It's not to say that this is all going to come together and be a ten-player transaction, but. You know, maybe it is. Maybe, maybe, maybe everything. Like we went from this like cap strap league where no one changes hands. We've already seen two significant trades. Now we've got Carlson rumors and Chikrin rumors, and you know, maybe, maybe that that's that's how this ultimately ends up. But look, the Western Conference is wide open. I think that the the element, the sort of if you want to tie a a big bow around what's going on is, I think if you're in Edmonton shoes, it makes sense to be thinking big. I mean, Los Angeles currently holds down a wild card spot. They have a negative goal differential like this late in the year. I, I don't know that I've ever seen that. So it, it would be pretty enticing if you're the Kings to say like, look, our team is performing pretty well, but we have some obvious issues. If they can shore up the goaltending or the, some of their defensive play, maybe, maybe they go on a run. I mean, I, look, they, they gave the Oilers all they could handle in round one last year. And and if you add pieces like Chikrin into the mix, you know, plus a healthy Doughty who wasn't part of that playoff series last year, plus potentially a goaltender. I mean, who knows who like I, I think that there's 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 a lot of incentive out there for Western Conference teams that feel like they have a shot, whether that's Dallas, whether that's Winnipeg, obviously the the Oilers will see what the Flames do. You know, even the Seattles and Vegas of the world. We haven't really got to Vegas. They got all this cap space all of a sudden with the Mark Stone surgery. So um th th there is like maybe that we might need that to to spice up the trade deadline. And it kind of seems like it's coming together. It seems like it. Speaking of Edmonton. Uh, what do you have on Yessi Bulliarvi, whose future has been in question for what feels like forever? Well, there's been trade interest on him. Obviously, at this point, we're talking about teams basically taking him for next to nothing or very little. It's not it's not as a, an asset, you know, befitting of a former first, fourth overall pick. Uh, but that's where he's at, uh, you know, in terms of this this being a really difficult season for him offensively. I know he did some interviews back with Finnish reporters talking about how his confidence has kind of been shot. You know, I think he's a he's a prime start fresh, you know, give him a fresh start and see what happens candidate. He's not that old of a player. Um, and he has strong defensive metrics. So I think at, at minimum, if you're adding him 
if you're not adding him as the fourth overall pick, if you're just adding him for as, as an asset you've acquired for relatively little, you know, I think that there's a lot of utility to the player. Uh, and the Oilers are at a point where Kyler Yamamoto is ready to come off long-term injured reserve. Um, you know, even for any trades they make, they're going to have to to subtract some salary to add. And so I think Pooley Arby's time is, is more than likely drawing to a close here. And, you know, it's even possible he's put on waivers. I'm not saying that he's ne- that that's necessarily what's going to happen, but I think if he clears waivers, the way we saw, say, Jacob Branich clear waivers earlier in the year, Adam Ernie's cleared waivers. I mean, a number of good NHL players have, have passed through waivers on claim this year because they have some salary attached to them. You know, I think that that makes Pooley Arvey even more of a tradable asset because the team acquiring them could then move them up and down from the HL to the NHL, kind of see where he's at, manage their own cap that way. So, um, you know, don't don't have all the specifics just yet, but it does, you know, the, we're all waiting for a, a roster move uh, one way or another in Edmonton. And that's that's unrelated to the, the Carlson rumors. It's just that they've, they're managing a cap situation with Yamamoto ready to come back healthy. Okay, one other player I want to mention. Uh, Patrick Kane, who uh, I think probably would have liked to have been a New York Ranger, as opposed to Vladimir Tarasenko uh, getting moved from St. Louis to the Rangers. Like, it's one thing for, for us to speculate, like, hey, he might like it. Uh, he pretty much went out and told the media that uh, he was pretty surprised that uh, they went for Tarasenko. And I think he really wanted to be a New York Ranger. What did you think of that whole situation? Well, that's consistent with what I've heard all along, that if, and it still remains an if, he leaves Chicago, that that the Rangers were the number one destination in Patrick Kane's mind that he'd like to play. And look, he's not alone. I mean, if you pulled a lot of players that play in other cities and just said, if you were traded tomorrow, like you can't stay where you are, where's the number one place you'd want to go? I think you, you'd have a high percentage of players saying they want to play in Manhattan at Madison Square Garden on a team that, that has a chance to do something, right? I mean, they're, they're last year's Eastern Conference finalists. They got quality up and down the lineup. I know at times this year, maybe bit like a little underwhelming their performance, but this is a team that isn't far off. And and so, yeah, I think that that you saw a lot of frustration in Patrick Kane and the, the interview he did with the Chicago reporters after that deal went down, you know, even acknowledging that it's, you know, I haven't not the happiest I've been seeing a trade. And, you know, he, he did say it's one of the places he would have want to go. You know, I'll take it one further for him. I, I believe it was the number one place he would want to go. And so now we're in a really interesting spot with Patrick Kane. Cause you know, let's, let's presume this takes the Rangers out of it. I mean, maybe there's a world, maybe there's a world at the last second. If the acquisition cost goes way down, they get crazy and try to add him too. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't see that happening right now, but you can't rule anything out in, in the wide world of sports, you know, where else might Patrick Kane play? Like, I, I don't know if there's anywhere. And I think that that's what he's got to decide. I mean, obviously there was some emotion and, and disappointment, that the Tarasenko deal, I think, happened so soon. Um, you know, Patrick Kane obviously is dealing with some degree of a hip injury. I mean, he's he's downplayed it to reporters, but there, that concern is out there for other teams. I, I know that for for a fact that that you know what version of him are you getting? How healthy is he? But would he consider going to say Dallas if the Vegas Golden Knights came calling? Um, would he go there? You know, I, I don't know. He's got to decide that. Like this is such a unique situation. Because usually players of star quality that have full new no movement clauses, usually we're not talking about them being dealt at the deadline, right? I mean, this this doesn't really happen a whole lot. And, you know, it's it's hard to see. It's hard to know what he's thinking. But I would say that the fact that he's disappointed that that trade, you know, that that, that, that option is no longer on the table, it kind of indicates he's thinking about where else he's going to go, right? It, it sort of tells us that, you know, he maybe the idea of at least one more playoff run is pretty appealing because it's been a long time since I know the Chicago is part of the bubble series and all that, but like, let's remove that and since he's played in like real playoff games with fans and all that sort of thing. So um, this will be one we're on. I, I think within the next week, maybe a little bit more, we're going to know one way or the other, if he's, if he'll either even consider going somewhere else than, or if he'll just play out the year in Chicago. Um but stay tuned. And Chicago just happens to be whipping through Eastern Canada with all these games uh, this week. So there'll be lots of speculation and discussion. And I'm sure a few more interviews with Patrick Kane as he visits Ottawa, Montreal and Toronto and the like. What about uh, Patrick Kane's hip? How much uh, does that play a role in, in him being moved? It plays a role. I mean, I can only go on what he's saying. Like he said publicly, he feels better this year than he felt last year. You know, he had 90 plus points last year. He had a, strong season production wise. 
And, but you know, look, any team that would be making that trade would be very privy to the, the, the documentation. Like I would, it wouldn't even surprise me if they had to have their own doctors, you know, take a look at him before the, a trade could be approved. I, I think it would be at that level because, you know, most of the teams that, that would be in the running for them, like this would be their big move. Right. So they have to have some, some confidence that, that, you know, they're, they're going to get a version of him that, that can make, you know, make a difference or can be on their top line or maybe their second line if it's a really stacked team. So, um, you know, it, it will have a factor, but if Patrick Kane is saying publicly, he feels better this year than last year. I mean, that's almost good enough for me. Uh, you know, the, the final word would come down to if there's another team he's willing to go to, they'd have to be comfortable with what they see in the medical file. Um, but certainly like that was part, like the Rangers were looking at Timo Meyer and Patrick Kane before making the Tarasenko deal. And one of the concerns they had on Kane was just having to wait to see where he was at with his hip. And, you know, I think that they were worried about the acquisition cost and, and the cap implications um, potentially, you know, even if, you know, they got Tarasenko at half retained. So he's like a $3.75 million cap hit uh, prorated for them. So, you know, it was going to cost more to get Meyer for, in terms of what you give up. It's, it was, there was going to be more of a, a cap cost to Kane and you had the hip injury mixed in there. And so they acted early and went to Tarasenko, you know, I, so that does, sh that does shed some idea that that's, that's kept things, you know, and on the Kane case, I think that that's complicated the issue for, you know, some of the teams that might look at them like, look, this is, I think it's still the, by production, the, the lowest points per game Patrick Kane's had in his NHL career. So there should be concern. And now there's, there's other explanations for it. Like if you tell me maybe he hasn't, certainly hasn't had the kind of line mates he's going to have on any team that might trade for him. That's, that's a fact. If maybe all the losing and just the kind of season it is, I mean, we, we, we've been talking about Chicago in the Bedard sweepstakes, uh, you know, the tank hard for Connor Bedard stuff since like July. So the players know that stuff if we know it. So, you know, maybe the motivation hasn't been as high, you know, plus the physical element, plus the, the lineup. I mean, there's, there's mitigating factors there, but, but yeah, that's, it's going to, be an issue and now the ultimate issue honestly to me the biggest issue is does he want to play anywhere else if the rangers are off the table which it appears they are would he go to another team and and we don't yet have that answer anything else you want to mention on kane before we get to ask cj i think that's good i feel All like right. i've been talking my brain's just like uh dude i i, I you've been able to give some pretty great answers uh, i haven't even finished the full questions. coffee i've been talking so much this episode Want to bet? Then get in on the action at Sports Interaction. Whatever your sport, Sports Interaction has you covered. Bet pregame, in-game, or in one of our many unique prop bets. Head to sportsinteraction.com slash SDPN, or in Ontario, download the app now by using the QR code at the bottom of the screen. 19 and over, please play responsibly. Okay, take a big swig uh, while I intro uh, Ask CJ uh, for this here Monday, uh, where we take in questions from you guys. Uh, off of Twitter and off of Discord. Uh, you, we've mentioned Timo Meyer here and there on the today's episode. Here's a question from Real Chris Cote on Timo Meyer: If the Carolina Hurricanes miss on Timo Meyer, who else is on their radar? On my on the radar for Meyer, you think? Uh, I think they meant for the Hurricanes. But if you want to look at it the other way and see who else might be on Meyer, I why not? Let's go into let's go into both sides. Well, you know, New Jersey, it's no secret, is is quite interested in Timo Meyer. Um, so I, I think that they're an option. You know, I do think the Leafs are are around Meyer at least. Um, you know, not to say that they're the front runner by any stretch, but I think that they've considered it. I mean, look, any team with any ambition has at least considered it. Um and you know, the one thing with Carolina is I, I don't know that they make the Meyer trade unless they know they can get him signed as part of it to a longer term extension. And, you know, Timo Meyer may or may not be willing to do that. You know, as of this weekend, his agent Claude Lemieux still hasn't had the green light to, to talk to other teams about what, what that might look like. So, you know, that's not really in the works at this point. And Carolina just isn't, you know, Carolina's a smart front office, like just full stop. I think that they're playing like 3d chess compared to what most of the other teams in the league are not all. I mean, Tampa, Julian Breezebaugh's work speaks for itself. You know, I think that Kyle Dubas has done a great job managing the least roster. Like there's lots of other 
good GMs or smart front offices, but the Hurricanes, they don't do the obvious thing, right? Like they don't go and trade a whole bunch of draft capital for, you know, the shiniest rental toy. And so like, I, I think that we have to keep our eyes on them doing something a little more off the radar, um, you know, but they certainly need some scoring help. I, I think that they were going to be in that marketplace, uh, you know, even with, even in a world where Max Pacioretty was healthy, unfortunately, you know, Pacioretty suffered the second torn Achilles. And so, you know, now they, they need scoring uh, to, to, you know, to boost their chances. I mean, they're a very good team. So I don't know, maybe they, maybe they look at some of the other options, whether that, like, is James Van Reems like a fit? I'm not, I'm not sure what the way they play. Um, but I think that they'll unearth something maybe a little less obvious than, than that. If, if, if the Meyer thing falls through and, you know, at this point in time, we don't know that. This next question I think is the hardest one you're going to have to answer, uh, from Uh-oh. Taylor Choma. What are your top five Super Bowl foods? Pizza, pizza. Oh, okay. Chili. Meatballs. Okay. Chicken wings. This is not as hard as I thought it was going to be. Um, I spoke too soon. I don't know chips and guac. Does that count? Yeah, I, I think that counts. That's. I thought you were gonna. I thought you were gonna be mangling your brain, considering how uh you've gone through all these topics, and he's like, oh crap, I gotta think about Super Bowl food. That was pretty quick. Well, it's the morning after Super Bowl, so I had to. I had to entertain which of those items I was gonna have last night. I that went too. for the chili. Went for the chili. Good call on the chili. That was kind of like a family tradition when I was a kid. We would we would always have chili when the Grey Cup was on or the Super Bowl. My grandma would come over too. We we'd actually like place small bets, like dollar or two dollar bets on the game and stuff like that. So that's nice. Uh yeah. from Evelyn Halpert. Uh probably no relation to Jim Halpert from the office. Do you think the Rangers will make another move? I do think they'll make another move. You know, another part of the Tarasenko piece, you know, I was mentioning the cap implications of the other players they might have went for is that it they protected some flexibility to make, you know, it will be in my estimation, probably a smaller move, but I, I still think that they're well positioned to, to do something else to, to maybe help down their, the lineup a little bit. So, I mean, look, this, it's a pretty deep team, fully healthy. You line them up like left to right, go through the D go, go to their goaltender. I mean, that's, that's a team that could win a Stanley cup, but I, I think that we'll see them make another smaller move closer to the deadline. Next one from Mark. Is Matthew Nyes good enough right away to make Michael Bunting expendable this summer? Don't have the answer to that yet. Um, You know, what I can tell you is that there haven't really been significant talks at all between Michael Bunting and the Leafs on a contract extension. So that suggests that the organization is probably going to leave that decision until after what happens in the playoffs. And, you know, after that time, they will probably see Matthew Nyes play some NHL games potentially even playoff games and they might have a clearer view of the decision they're making. But I, I think the Leafs want to leave open as much flexibility as possible and entering this summer, they have all kinds of cap space. I think that there's no mystery or there's no question that Michael Bunting would, would rather all things being equal. He'd, he'd love to stay in Toronto. He's a local kid. He's had a lot of success with the team. I think he's well liked and, and has carved out a nice role with the Leafs, but you know, they haven't even, they're not even exploring the contract talks yet. So I can't, I can't say if there's a fit or not uh, because they're not exchanging numbers. They're not seeing where the fit is. I think, I think like a lot of things in Toronto, like it's going to be whenever the last game of the season is in Toronto, man, it's going to be crazy for the next few weeks after that, because in pretty quick succession, there's got to be a decision made on Kyle Dubas's future, you know, and then if, if, if there's a world where they're making a change at the general manager, then they have to go find the next general manager in pretty short order, I would think, because, you know, by July 1st, they need to have a contract extension done with Austin Matthews. There need to, to be decisions on all kinds of UFAs, big and small, including Michael Bunting, but also, you know, Pierre Engvall, Justin Hall, um, Alex Kerfoot. You know, I mean, they, they have eight or 10 unrestricted free agents. And then there's an extension potentially for William Nylander. I mean, it there will be fireworks. It, it might be more dramatic in the off season than even in the playoffs around the Leafs. Like that's, that's the potential we're talking about. So I, it's it's tough to say what Matthew Nyes is going to be. I mean, he's having a, another strong year in the NCAA. Thought of as you know probably one of the best prospects at the power forward position of any NHL team. But do we really know what he is until we see him in the NHL? I, I think that you know if he's ready right away or not. I mean that I think only time will will give us that answer. 
I don't know how this Leaf season is going to end. All I know is, is that I'm looking forward to your traditional episode with the STP where you break down everything that happens. Yeah, me too. I mean, I guess it, there's there's ways it's not that crazy. I guess if they go and have a really successful playoffs, if they win the Stanley Cup, there's probably a lot of those questions will have already been answered. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like you're not you're not you're not moving on from your general manager, even if they get to like the third round. Like I, you know, I think that we'll know that then. It's it's really more if they lose in the first round again. That's that's where it could get wild. And and like the reality is, they might play a great series as they did last year. I would contend against Tampa and still lose, right? Um. But then, you know, we're looking at changes. I, I don't know which ones yet, but it if if the season ends in like April 28th or something instead of May or June, um, it could be it could be really crazy for a couple of weeks. Uh, next one from uh, Claude Andre. Uh, what is the latest on the NHL's investigation of the Team Canada events and the status of Alex Formanton? Nothing to update there. I mean, Bill Daly discussed it last weekend at all-star break. You know, they keep saying they're right at the finish line. I, I haven't heard any more than that. Um, you know, we still haven't heard from London police or hockey Canada's investigation. So unfortunately I'm not, I'm not punting on the question or ignoring it or brushing it aside. I just, I don't have any new information to bring to the table um, at this point in time, but you know, I, I would assume we're, we're going to get some clarity sooner than later. Um but that's that's all I got for you. Okay. From Leifer. Uh, hey, CJ and Julian, Leafs related question, as if we don't get enough of those on this show. I'm kidding. Do you th- not think uh, Kyle Dubas will make a boo for someone we aren't thinking of? Yeah, I think it's possible. Um, because the Leafs also don't necessarily do the obvious thing. Um, you know, I, I don't think he's bluffing about saying he's not giving up his first round pick for a rental. Uh, so maybe find some with term. I think that's like in a perfect world, I'm sure that's what he would like to do. He'd like to find a player that is signed a couple of years that he feels strongly about. And then if you're giving up, a, you know, a sizable amount of assets, future assets to, to get that player, you feel better about it knowing you're, you're he's going to be part of the roster for a few years. So I think it's possible. I mean, look, there's been more talk now about Timu Meyer maybe being someone that, that would make sense for the Leafs. Like, I guess, so maybe that doesn't count as a surprise if it happens, but I, I do know there's at least some merit to that idea, but there's, it's funny. It's hard to get a read too. Like, obviously the Leafs aren't saying too much about this, um, but I think there's a lot of different opinions around that team about what should happen. Uh, and within that front office, you know what I mean? And so it's uh I, I can't tell you who the player is going to be or, or players that are, that are coming in. So yeah, I think it's possible. It's a surprise because I, I already can't say with any certainty who, who they're going to go acquire. Um, but I, you know, I will, they're going to do something like they're not, this is not a year where they can just stand pat. I don't think. Last one for you from over Joe Pepsi or Coke. Coke. There you have it. People. One word answer. No hesitation. Yeah. I mean, I don't drink either, really. But if I, if I was picking one, it would be Coke. I don't think it's that different between both Pepsi. Oh, and wow. Coke. That's a take. I think it really, I, I actually think it tastes quite different. Well, can you explain the difference then? I don't know. Is Coke maybe a little sweeter? Is it? I, I, I don't know. I, but I don't, how do you explain the difference? Like, it's not like we're not doing like wine tasting here. Like, ooh, there's, there's hints of peat in this Coke. We and, could. The, and, you know, the Pepsi has notes of charcoal. Like, I, I don't know. I don't know how to like, I don't have the ability to articulate it, but I, for me, it does taste like I, I would be very confident in a blind taste test that I would nail it 10 out of 10 times. I think when we do the live show in Coburg, whenever that comes to light, we should have you do a taste test of Pepsi and Coke. All right. I Like, I feel very confident that I would nail that. I feel like, this live show in Coburg is going to like, we're like already there's the half K idea thrown around. We're going to have to do a movie corner. Um, (laughs) I know you're thrilled about that. No, I am. Uh, I told you I watched a movie recently. Uh, Which one was it again? The menu. The menu. Everyone says that's supposed to be really good. Yes. Yeah. It was, it was like kind of twisted, but it was good. 
Okay, I gotta I gotta be up on some movies then, because if you're watching that, well, I mean, actually, I watched everything everywhere all at once. Uh, I, okay. I might have said the title wrong, but uh, that's a really good movie that's gonna be up for some Oscars uh, sometime soon. All right. Well, the menu is gonna keep you up at night potentially. Oh boy, I don't know how I do with those types of movies. If it's gonna it's scare me like that, bit of a thriller. Okay. Psycholo- I would say psychological thriller. Psychological thriller. Like your brain just the whole time your brain just going like, oh wow, this is twisted. What's happening next? Like like you're like you're kind of like trying to anticipate what's coming. And there's a few, of course, just like any movie of the genre, there's a few things you, you almost couldn't see coming unless you're maybe a little smarter than me. Shout out to uh, both of us watching uh, some pretty cool movies. The menu and everything everywhere all at once. I watched it on a plane. When you watch a weird movie on a plane, like you're always just like, what are the people around me thinking? But <laughs> Do you see that there's like a photo, it was like a meme. Uh, I don't know if it's real or not, but it was a funny meme going dr- during the Super Bowl where people on a plane were, everyone was watching uh, the Super Bowl and like one guy decided to watch the movie Hitch with Will Smith and Kevin <laughs> James. I didn't see <laughs> so it. What's, I saw someone snap that photo. I thought it was a funny meme. Anyway, uh, this was a great Monday. Uh, Mondays are always great with you. Uh, a lot of info on this one. Uh, CJ, thank you for We're going to have to add great. in some extra pods, I think, these next few weeks. Like, it feels you like... Think? Well, because it feels like sometimes the break between pods, like a whole... Like, we miss, like, two news cycles. It, just because there's so much going on in the trade deadline period. So, I don't know. I, Let we us don't know have in the, the comment section. Let us know the comments section. You and producer cool Nick are idea. pretty damn busy, so I don't know how we can schedule that. But if we can, I'm okay with that idea if we can make it work for everyone's schedules. But also, if the people want it, and that's why I'm saying, like, hey, everyone in the comment section, let us know if you want more uh, pods a week as we deal with all the trade talk and trade activity. Like, if the people want it, like, we got to give the people what they want. Yeah, and we definitely have to do a Saturday, a rare Saturday episode, the day after the deadline. I think that that's a must. Yes. Just- when everything's fresh, like we couldn't wait till Monday, like that would be too nuts. No, so. it would be too crazy. Uh, there we go. Talking. Oh, yeah. About subscribe stuff because we're going to be filling. You don't just go pick us like normal Mondays and Thursdays. We're going to drop a special Tuesday or Wednesday or something on you. There's a Saturday coming up these next few weeks. You're going to have all the CJ show you can handle. You've been warned people. Uh, subscribe to the podcast. If you haven't already subscribe to the podcast, whether on YouTube or Spotify or Apple podcasts, Amazon, or I don't know, however you listen to podcasts nowadays, just subscribe to the damn podcast and uh, follow us on Twitter. Uh, Reporter Chris is Chris's handle. JK McKenzie is my Twitter handle. Follow us on Discord as well. Uh, Anything else we want to plug before I say goodbye to the people? No, that's good. That was that was a lot. That was a lot. I wish I could go for a nap right now, but I got some other jobs to take care of. Damn. I hope you're at least able to take some kind, like even if it's like 20 minutes, take a nap. Mix in a water if you have to. Oh, I, I try to, yeah. Four bottles of water a day, bud. Hey, that's always good to do. For Siege, I'm Julian. So long. Peace. We'll be back on Thursday. The Chris Johnson Show. Powered by Sports Interaction. Want to bet? Inside the game, twice a week. Follow Chris on Twitter at Reporter Chris. And follow Julian McKenzie at JK McKenzie. The Chris Johnston Show.